One, two, three, four. This is Liberty DeVito. He's on the short list of my biggest drumming inspirations, along with Martin Chambers, Neil Peart, Terry Bozio, Michael DeRozier, and Rob Ellis. His trademark drumming sound is hard-hitting and emotional, yet extremely balanced. He's self-taught, but seems to excel in just about every percussive genre. From track to track on every album, it bounces from pop to rock to Latin to jazz to funk to Motown to blues, to easy listening ballads, and from rock stadium anthems, to vaudeville-esque off-Broadway storytelling. Liberty's versatility is unmatched. I feel his biggest superpower was propelling Billy's lyrics by pulling the listener into the emotion of the song, verse by verse and crash by crash. Liberty was like a conductor of emotional dynamics, not to mention writing some of the most memorable fills ever recorded. His flams alone I've mimicked throughout my career. Throughout the years playing with Billy, Liberty was approached to work with other iconic artists like Carly Simon, Phoebe Snow, Karen Carpenter, Stevie Nicks, Rick Wakeman, Bob James, and Meatloaf. Focusing in on his balance, I could teach a themed class based on Liberty's playing with designated groove categories. For instance, Big Shot would be for quarter note independence, My Life, four on the floor grooves, Pressure, four on the floor halftime grooves. Only the good die young and baby grand, brushwork. Keeping the faith and moving out, eighth note and quarter note funk feel. Angry young man and scenes from an Italian restaurant, orchestrated accents, tempo changes and dynamics. Code of silence, displacement. Don't ask me why, the clave pulse. Tell her about it, uptown girl and an innocent man. Motown feel. Still rock and roll to me, straight versus shuffle. And that's just the beginning. Liberty was born in New York City of an Italian ancestry where his father was a police officer at the New York Police Department. He taught himself to play the drums after seeing the Beatles on their appearance on the Ed Sullivan Show in February 1964. I hear this story a lot in my interviews. Liberty went on to be one of the most influential drummers in rock history. Despite his mysterious firing from Billy's band in 2006 after a 30-year stint Billy was actually quite loyal in the beginning. Billy wanted that rougher, around-the-edges rock band feel, as opposed to the hired gun, singer-songwriter thing. There was actually a time where Sir George Martin was in line to produce the next Billy Joel record. George wanted to use studio musicians. Billy refused and said his new band records with him or no deal. So it was no deal. In stepped Phil Ramone to produce a series of Grammy-winning albums. These included The Stranger, 52nd Street, Glass Houses, Songs in the Attic, The Nylon Curtain, An Innocent Man, The Bridge, Concert Live in Russia, Stormfront, River of Dreams, and The Greatest Hits Records 1 through 3. You would think that that would be a fulfilling enough career for most, but no, Liberty is still rocking. He started two new bands, The Slim Kings and Lords of 52nd Street. The Slim Kings released two albums and multiple singles, landing music featured on shows like Bloodline, Netflix, Chicago PD, and Chicago Fire, on NBC, Nurse Jackie, on Showtime, and many others. The band toured with ZZ Top, Los Lonely Boys, and continues to play in the tri-state region regularly. They also have an upcoming appearance on Live at Daryl's House Club with Daryl Hall on November 9th. More info at DarylsHouseClub.com. In 2003, DeVito signed on as an official supporter of Little Kids Rock, a nonprofit organization that provides free musical instruments and instruction to children in underserved public schools throughout the United States. Liberty has been to the top of the mountain and sunk to the darkest depths, but he is back on his feet with renewed energy and charging forward. He was kind enough and patient enough with my persistence to join me for a bit. Let's catch up with him. This is great. Where are you? 
I'm in uh, the Seattle mountains. Oh. Yeah. So nice up there, right? Good sunset. Yeah, it's like 20 minutes outside of the city, and I got my music studio here. I have a little uh, school I, for the I kids. See that. Yeah. I see some autographed drum heads up there. Yeah, is it, you know, I like to collect on the tours. So I play with Duff of uh, Guns N' Roses and he's in a band called Loaded. And so these are all the tours we've been on. There's like uh, Motorhead and there's uh, Morrissey and um, on and on. Oh, it's a little wall of fame down here. It's kind of fun and I teach the kids, but I wanted to thank you for, for coming on. I really love the book. I wanted to say this oh, thanks. right off the bat. Hudson Music, uh... right? Yeah, that's it. Hudson Music or Amazon, either one. Yeah, you can find it anywhere. Um, I did just catch last week or a couple weeks ago the sessions with Dom and you and Paul Quinn and Steve Lukather. Yeah. That was really cool. I, I don't think anyone can talk enough about the Beatles, but you guys went on for the, on the Beatles for a long time, and I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> well, I watch the Beatles. I listen to the Beatles channel all the time. I have a three-year-old daughter, and she's in love with the Beatles. So in the car, I have to have the Beatles channel on all the time. And if you're not in the car, she's playing the CDs in, in my, uh, on my stereo. <laughs> I mean, you can't go wrong. It's like, it's, it's timeless. You know, it started jumping up and down the, on the bed with the tennis racket and right. you, know, just, right. you know, all about that, you know, the Ed Sullivan show and, and all that. But, um, Dom, Dom and Paul, I met them at the Mapex summit last August and, um, they were, they were really cool too. Um, I was going through some publishing issues late last year and they kind of guided me through that. So it was really cool to see everyone in the same room um, sharing musical stories and uh, I really like the stuff that you shared. Um, but this might be a little different. Um, so there's just a handful of drummers. I'm self-taught also. Um, I've been touring for 30 years. Um, and uh, you know, there's like Martin Chambers, Terry Bozio, you, Neil Peart, and uh, maybe Michael DeRozier from Heart. Those, that's like my nucleus for being a self-taught drummer that I learned off of vinyl. Wow, you got me in good company. Yeah, uh, even memorizing the skips, you know, like uh, off of uh, glass yeah. houses, or I'd, I'd turn those into fills, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, so, oh, and da, 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 da. I really like, um, let me say at, at first, and I can edit anything out you don't want. Is there anything in the book you, you wouldn't rather talk about? Oh, talk about everything, it's okay. there. Great. I'm going through a little bit, a little bit of darkness myself right now with the spine injury I had last year. Um, what happened? What happened? What'd you do? So I was, I was um, hired to play for Roger Fisher of Heart. He was putting together another band to do all the Heart stuff. And his brother, okay. Michael, the magic man is still the manager. And um, so he's putting together this band. We're going to tour around and do all the Heart stuff. And after the very first show, I was driving home through the mountains, switchbacks, and we just had a huge snowstorm. I got ejected out of the driver's side window uh, paralyzed for a couple of days ended up oh. having spine surgery five broken ribs this left ear had to be sewn back on um so that was tough i was in the hospital for 30 days and um never thought i'd drum again so we're, we're over a year later i'm able to drum and i'm able to play out and teach thankfully but it is an uphill battle every day trying to get the the quick twitch nerves i have a lot of nerve damage and yeah it's really frustrating so i, I know about I know about the lows. I know, I know in the book that you, you, you were hospitalized. Um, you had the knee replacement and you said had some other ailments and. Yeah. Well, when I decided I wasn't going to play drums anymore, was when I had a car accident. Wow. Uh, it, it's in the book when I was on the road with Richie Super, uh, Super's Jamboree. And I had a car accident, flipped the van, the equipment van. And wow. Broke every bone in my face and uh, said, that was it. I'm not touring anymore. It was the snowstorm too. Again. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I get it. I get it, man. It's horrible. I actually had a, an electronic drum set delivered to the hospital way before I was even able to stand up, and the doctors are pissed off about that. But it, just so I could stare at something across the room. Yeah. You know, just to get the mind, the mind working. And eventually I was able to crawl over on a cane and, like, start tapping things. And I think that went a long way for me. Yeah, well, you get support from friends and other musicians, you know, that you, you, you're going to get better, you're going to play. Richie Canada from the uh, uh, Lord of the Sex Street, he had uh, cancer. They found um, uh, cancer cells in his back. Yeah. And he was like stage, like the next stage you die, you know. And um, a friend of his kept going over and saying, you'll play sax again. You will play sax. When he started to try to play sax, he couldn't open the zipper on the sax case. 
Mm -hmm. now it's like you would never know he was sick, you know? Wow. Those are the victory stories I like to hear. Yeah. Because most of the time I'm throwing the kid across the room and then the next week I'll be able to do something I wasn't, haven't been able to do since the accident. Right. <laughs> I'm very impatient. Yeah. yeah. I want to well, be it's, back like that, it's like that in life anyway, you know? You yeah. throw the kid across the room and because you can't do something and then uh, you know, next time you sit down, you go like, oh, that wasn't as difficult as I thought it was. Yeah. You know? And I know my because brain has a, a lot to do with it. I, I psych myself out a lot. Like, here comes that tricky part in the chorus, you know, and boom, right. I fuck it up. It's like, right. I just did it the last chorus. Why can't I do it this chorus? I right. I do, I do the same thing. I do the same thing. When I, when I have to learn tunes, you know, because I don't read or write, I have to write my own style of writing. Mm -hmm. Endings are a bitch, especially if they're not on the record. If the record fades out, then I yeah. go to the gig and the musical director, who is usually Will Lee or somebody like that, hands yeah. me a chart and goes, okay, this is how it's going to end. It's like, I got to fake it until I memorize <laughs> it. <laughs> I love that. I yeah. love that. I play in this um, Tower Power cover band um, and I was, I was invited into it from Ben Smith. He plays in Heart. And uh, when he goes out on the road, I fill in for him. And he handed me a book of charts like this thick. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, here's the charts. You know, you'll be fine. Just show up on stage. You know, it's like, so I, what I did is I went to a show I went to one show before he left town and I recorded the whole thing. And I just walked, walked and walked for hours and just programming what I was yeah. hearing and all the endings and all the little um, intricate things he was doing. And then I would write, like you, I'd write out my own chicken scratch. Right. Sometimes it would be, you know, whatever. Um, okay, get, when you get to the third course, do a little Mitch Mitchell thing here. Or, you know, right, you know, right. Make sure the the little, little codes, little codes. I'll, I'll write the same thing on top. Ronnie Spector here. Yeah. Yep. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. It's going to go in half time. It works. Yeah. Yeah. It works. <laughs> Just don't let the boss know, right? No, no. Yeah. Um, what I love about your playing, so I was, I first got introduced to you. So I grew up um, in, in, in Orange County, in, in LA, and um, there's a radio station called K-Rock, 106.7, and it was mainly new wave. It was mainly cutting edge, you know, we're crossing over from the 70s into synthesizers and punk rock and quirky sounds and um, female lead singers who wore leather and, and said bad words and, and stuff like this. Right. But what, uh, so Glass Houses was like the movie Blues Brothers came out and um, Glass Houses was around that time and Pretenders 2 came out. I was obsessed with the Pretenders and Martin Chambers and I had yeah. eight track tape machine, <laughs> if you can remember those. And so Glass Houses was this, this on a loop and just the, the aggressiveness that you play with, I, I, I felt your emotion right away. Yeah. You're a really balanced player. I mean, it's a sin to not go back um, and just, you know, let's go through all your hits. Like, we don't have time for that. So I'm going to be very specific on these, on these 80s records. Um, just in, in the dead heads, the, the way they were, they, the way they're tuned down. And um, you're, you're, you have all these classic fills on these records, you know, Nylon Curtain and, and, and this stuff. And it, it really caught it, it, like, the way you play just, like, jumped through the speakers. And that, that's that's the part that influenced me. And it was really like you were playing from your heart and you can hear that. And I'm not sure how you arranged it with the band in the studio, but you know, you know how it is. A, a 300 drummers can hit a snare drum. It's going to sound 300 different ways, you know, right, so you exactly. definitely had your own exactly. swing, the Liberty yeah. swing. Well, well, uh, I'll tell you the secret. You know, I always say this when, when I go to a drum clinic and I see like a Weckl or, or Vinnie Kelly or something like that, I'll say like, I'm not really a drummer. If they're drummers, I'm not really a drummer. I just play one on stage. Right. You know? uh, so m my thing is that I love lyrics. Mm. I'm into lyrics. I want to know what, what, when Billy was writing songs, I would get his lyric and, and I would follow what he's saying emotionally. I want to know, I want to connect emotionally to B Billy's lyric. And that's why it sounds like it's coming from the heart, not from a chart. Yeah. You know? You know, honesty, so, it's yeah. like, that's dynamics from the, from the start right. to the end. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to creep up on you, and then the, you're pulling the audience in. That's, right. that's well, what I hear. You know, in the, in the forward of the book, when Billy says that I took his songs and, and you know, whatever I did with them, he says, uh, yeah, that, that's what I did. I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to get into the emotion of, of, I didn't go to Vietnam, but, yeah, I had to go for my draft physical and all that kind of stuff. But, 
you know, I know emotionally what it was like because I know people that went, you know, guys that went. I know guys that didn't come back. So you put that emotion in it. I always said the hardest thing to do as a drummer is play a fast song that, that's kind of an uppity, funny kind of like fast song and then get to a really depressing slow song is the next one on the set list. You know, it's like, yeah. how do you come down to that? You know? It's you always like faster. 20, <laughs> yeah. 21, 30 songs. It's, every time you change, your emotion changes every song. Yeah. You know? So I used to sing along with them so I could, you know, think about like when my first girlfriend broke my heart or, you know, stuff like that. Especially yeah. live. I mean, at least in the studio, you can take a few walk around or, or take some breaths or, or drink whatever but live you're going back to back songs and like how to, to be able to control your adrenaline and your emotions to bring it back i know most drummers probably i never did most drummers have probably a, a bleeping metronome next to them to set themselves right in between songs which is probably the smart thing to do but well, i mean i played I, in so many aggressive bands screamy bands through the 2000s so hard to get back to that ballad the next song yeah it's rough <laughs> it's really hard yeah you know it's like trying to you, you drive you know in new york city here the, the speed limit is 25 miles an hour 25 miles an hour on all the roads in new york city hmm. when i come off a of 95 or a highway like that or you know a, a major interstate highway and i come back to the city I have a hard time coming down and, and driving 25 again. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> you know, you've been track. driving 70 you know, miles an hour. So it's the same thing with music. You're going, you're playing pressure, and then the next song is like honesty. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, wow. How do you come down from that, you know? So, um, again, as, as a self-taught drummer, you know, you hear all these pop rock hits, and, you know, there's four four mid-tempo pop rock hits or whatever. But you also have, through your whole catalog, there's jazz influences, there are reggae influences, there's um, Latin influences, you're playing with brushes, there's disco beats and everything. So besides, I know you, you mentioned, you know, Ringo, of course, and then the Rascals. What yeah. other drummers did you, did you pull from to, to bring those um, genres into Billy's music? Well, always my, my favorite, of course, started with Ringo. Well, mm -hmm. well first of all, my mother loved the drums. Uh, and, and that's probably how I got to, to play the drums because my mother just loved them. And uh, I asked my father why he got me drums. And he said, because they didn't make Prozac when I was a kid. So, you know, to calm me down, I guess they got a set of drums. But my mother loved it. She loved Gene Krupa, mm -hmm. loved Gene Krupa. So I used to hear a lot of Gene Krupa. I didn't know who Buddy Rich was until I got older, you know? But, but uh, and you can tell it in my style of this, this simplistic, but more from the heart. Gene is more from the heart from me than Buddy is. Buddy's chops, Gene's from the heart, you know? Mm -hmm. You could see that, that craziness that, that, he, that he does and stuff like that. So there's Krupa, then there's Ringo. Dino Dinelli blew Ringo off the, the drum stool for me because mm -hmm. I, I, I saw that the drummer could be as much focused as a lead singer. You know, Carmine of Peace, definitely. Mm -hmm. Then there was a guy, um, then there was uh, Mitch Mitchell and uh, Jimmy, Hen uh, in the Jimmy Hendrix experience and Ginger Baker those two at the same time. And another one, uh, Jim Capaldi was in a band called Traffic that mm -hmm. Steve Winwood was in. There is a lot of influence uh, in Billy Joel music from Traffic. Oh, wow. You know, that, that whole, uh, when we play those, the, the, what are they, 16s on the high hand? Yeah. That's very Traffic. The one handed 16th note. Yeah. Very Traffic. Hmm. And, um, yeah, so he was a big influence. And then, of course, you know, you, you grow on. I, for a period there, my favorite drummers were Paul McCartney and Stevie Wonder. You know, <laughs> I love the way they play drums. Interesting. You know? And, and you, you think about, like, they really don't know how to play drums, but they know how to feel drums, you know? So how do you feel something, like a, a, the fill in a, help, a little help from my friends? Mm -hmm. That little fill, when he goes, da 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 ba boom ba ba boom ba But if you change that fill, you might as well change the chords of the song. You know, yeah. that fill is so good right there. You know? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, and then, um, you know, I fell in love with drummers. Uh, Stuart Copeland, loved Stuart Copeland. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, first time I heard Stuart Copeland, I had to pull a car over. <laughs> first time I heard, first time I heard, uh, uh, what's his name, um, uh, Billy, um, really fast drummer, uh, Billy Cobham. 
first yeah. time I heard him was with uh, he, play, he played on uh, 2001 with D- Diodato did a version of the 2001 thing, the funky thing, pull the car over. First time I heard Bob Molly in the well is I shot the sheriff, pull the car over. Could not believe what I was listening to. Mm-hmm. There's so much emotion in that. You know, <clears throat> first time I heard Bernard Purdy play yeah. uh, that Phil in Rocksteady it was like, whoa, what <laughs> is that? These yeah. people were, were coming up with this stuff that I, I've never heard before. They're just coming up with new stuff. You know, I mean, I had the long story with Bernard. He was telling me that, that he used to live by a railroad track when he was growing up. And he used to hear the train go by. And he said, when he first started to do it, you know, he was first developing that, that groove. The guys in the band would turn around and go, stop playing that. You're messing me up. Stop it. You know, they just wanted to straight shuffle. <laughs> you know? so, That's funny. Yeah. I, I was, I was in a, I get this treatment called Synexis where they inject my, I have this thing called drop foot um, from the oh, spinal yeah, cord I, injury. It, it, they inject me with vitamins in my nerves and then they hook me up to electricity. And my, my wife's a drummer also. And uh, she was, she went to the appointment and the machine had a rhythm that was like, for like 45 <laughs> minutes and she was like doing a rap over the top of it while I was, while I was getting the treatment I mean like electrocuted and she's turning it into a Nine Inch Nails song it's kind of funny that's uh, uh, great you can get influenced by organic things you can get influenced by uh, industrial things don't that's how a drummer's mistakes. mind works don't forget mistakes you oh know, yeah I mean uh, I, I, I spoke to Hal Blaine and I asked him you know about the beat on uh, Be My Baby boom mm. Boom, boom, brah. He said when he was playing the song, he was playing like boom, 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 uh, um, the, mm. the two and four on the snare drum. And his stick got caught under his sleeve. So oh. it went boom, 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 boom. And it was oh, caught wow. under his sleeve. And, and Spectre, Phil Spector said, that's it, that's it, that's it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's cool how you can get, um... Uh, a, a couple things. Uh, one quick one is to me, um, not being so influenced by Mitch Mitchell and Ginger Baker, to me, they sound very similar. How would you differentiate their styles? I think, you know, you, you mentioned uh, uh, Twitch, you know. Uh, a quick uh, Twitch muscle, yeah. Yeah, quick Twitch and, and slow Twitch. I think uh, Mitch was quick and, and Ginger was slow, hmm. you know. I do a whole thing in, in my drum clinic about the twitch uh, fibers in, in, inside you. And I always compare like uh, uh, Buddy and Gene. Uh, uh, Buddy was quick, Gene was slow, twitch. Uh, you know, uh, Ginger Baker, Mitch Mitchell. Uh, uh, I, and I say, Charlie Watts is no twitch. He's not twitch at all. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Hold it down. But, but you know, uh, yeah. but I mean, you know, you talk about a, a drummer that is idolized like everybody loves him, uh, that was a slow twitch drummer that doesn't play fast at all. And that was uh, John Bonham. Yeah. He didn't, he didn't play fast at all. To me, he is, I can't believe I'm like talking like this. I'm, I haven't spoken to somebody in so long. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, he, he was an R&B drummer put behind a big set. That's what he sounds like to me. Mm-hmm. You know, just great. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, he's got a lot of Motown roles in, in his playing. And, and I wasn't a Zeppelin guy. I was a new wave guy. And I, I you know, Stuart Copeland, yes. And, and all these new wave bands, right. Simple Minds, Big Country, Adam and the Ants, Bow Wow, all this Burundi beat. Um, but I, I did, I did, re- I understood his importance to drumming, but I gravitated toward the drummers who came after him, who stole from him and made it better, in my opinion, which was Michael DeRozier. Right. He took a whole bunch of Bonham stuff and he made it quick, more quick twitch and he made it a little fancier and he was more on, he was more pushing the beat and the Martin Chambers stole a lot of stuff from Bonham too. He did, you know, the fake double kick on the floor tom stuff yeah. and all that stuff. I was like, wow. Um, uh, yeah, I was into single, single bass drummers who, who could make it sound like double bass. I was really into that stuff, whether it be you know, 16s with the floor tom or the bass drum or incorporating your floor tom and stuff like that. So um, I respect Led Zeppelin, but I was more influenced by the dudes who came after him who, who yeah. were influenced and, and just took it to another level. I've never yeah. been a, a, a Led Zeppelin fan. I, yeah. I, um, 
I like loved that first album, the, the one you know with his mistakes on it and everything. It's just <laughs> good times, bad times. Uh, but after that, it was like uh, his voice drove me nuts. You know, it kind of like uh, uh, what are they called? Uh, what's the band that Neil Peart was in? <laughs> oh, Rush. <laughs> Rush, thank yeah. you. Uh, yeah, that's another band. You know, Getty's voice, I have a hard time getting. Yeah, my wife, voice. my wife is, yeah, drives her crazy. That and Morrissey, she'll just run out of the room if any of those are on. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go um, through your Phil Ramone record. The records that are right in my wheelhouse as, as it's trying to teach myself the drums. 52nd Street, Glass Houses, Nylon Curtain, Innocent Man, and then The Bridge. And then, strangely enough, the first time I ever saw you live was actually Stormfront, even though like I was you know, loving all these songs or whatever. That was the first time I got to see you, which is, but I love like some of the stories. Um, right before that though, I, I, I really like the story about, um, well, I don't like that you were hungover, but um, it, <laughs> recording, <laughs> recording uh, Only the Good Die Young, oh, yeah. you mentioned you ripped that off from the Jimi Hendrix song, Up to the Sky. Yeah, Up from the Sky, yeah. Um, yeah, but I was having right. this big argument with Billy. You know, like, were you just, yeah. were you just, you took a nap in the in the closet right after you recorded yeah. it? Were you, were you barely hanging on when you recorded it, or were you just like, were you? Just, it was, oh, yeah. What what you hear on that record is all the energy I had that day. That was it. It kind you of the mood. Yeah, you didn't need to it, be like you know totally over the top energetic. It's just it fit right in. Everything that I play, whether it be uh, Only the Good Die Young or Big Man on Mulberry Street. Or, or stuff like that. Uh, it, it's a rock drummer trying to be a Latin guy or a jazz guy or something like that. that yeah. That's what it is. I'm basically a, when we went in to, do, to uh, do the rehearsals for the Bridge album, uh, we were playing uh, uh, Big Man on Mulberry Street, and I was playing it like a regular jazz swing thing, like da, 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 right. And Billy said, "No, no, no, don't do that." You're a rock drummer. Play it like a rock drummer would play it. I said, okay. <laughs> you know? So, you know, I, I've always been able, and Rosalind Designs is another one. I don't know how to play Latin, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I understand that after we left Cuba, it was taught as an American Latin beat in, uh, in Cuba. <laughs> well, I don't know what the I'm clave. doing. The clave. The yeah, clave yeah, yeah. pulse of everything. Yeah, I, was, um, I just wanted to, show my viewers it's another cool thing about the book is you track by track album by album uh, liberty goes into detail um just like little tidbits it doesn't go on for too long but just his memories of recording these these certain songs and that's that's my favorite thing about this book actually because that's the stuff i'm after um you know not just gear like what was i playing on but um what? how the songs were built and um how, how um it, the, the communication between the band and then things that were scrapped, you know, especially um, my favorite song off of um, Glass Houses was Lena. And yeah. you had the big stop ending at the end that you actually played through, but that was an edit. They edited it. Yeah, we came back to listen to the, the final mixes and it was like, where'd that stop come from? <laughs> what a cool drum beat. I mean, so it's not a normal not a predictable drum beat, a very aggressive, no. um, really, I mean, it starts out with a really pretty piano line, but just the way you come in and you're in the tom fills, it sounds to me like you like have an eight. I'm not sure how many toms you had on your kit for that record, but that da -da, da -da -da -da, you, do, you do some kind of high tom fills yeah. in there. And, um, and then this, you kind of have this reverse thing going on and, and, you're and the, you do these, um, these syncopated with the guitar and the bass, dun, dun, dun. Everyone's kind of accenting those. And that would have been really cool to be a fly on the wall to see you guys working that song out. I don't know if all oh, those accents were on the piano already, if you were working those Lena accents out with the band. Well, yeah, with the whole band when they got together, you know, you can hear what's important. That, that, uh, 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 yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and that uh, pia the piano kind of, Maybe that provided for that that, that hi hat pattern or something or that the kind yeah, of yeah. Well, you look rhythm. you look for something to grab onto, you know. Uh, I I'm, I got an email from some guy in England a couple of years ago who was in a band called Mama Duke Duke, and they had a record out, and the, the name of the song was Rubber Lover, and it started out with that, the whole band and us of us, and then it went into this like disco dance kind of thing. It was mm -hmm. really cool. 
and, and they used it in the middle of the song. And the guy wrote me, he goes, every time I try to write a song, I try to think, what would Liberty DeVito play on this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. Whatever he would play, it would be hard. <laughs> it would be passionate. Um, yeah. Kind of along those lines, I, you know, so I, I rented Long and Live in Long Island maybe mm -hmm. 20 times on VHS when it came out. Um, and it was, it was so cool. It was like, it was in the round. And right. I, that introduced me to the albums that I missed out on uh, previous of Glass Houses. And it was with the song like Angry Young Man. This sounds funny, but I kind of, I kind of parallel that with Rush's YYZ of all things, because there's so much, it, it has such a huge instrumental part in the beginning. And there's, it really right. focuses on you as a drummer and all these different techniques and all the fills and a lot of energy. Um, and I'm sure you've played, probably played that one a few times at your drum clinics, right? Oh yeah, always. That's a, <laughs> that's a big favorite. one. That's a favorite. You know, it was, it was hot, it's hard adjusting to when it's just one tom and one floor tom. Then I said, I don't know if I can do a drum man with just a tom and a floor tom, you know? Right. You, you need a couple more sticks, drums. Glow sticks in the air from the audience mimicking everything you're doing. <laughs> Always, always. You know, people ask all the time, do you have to stick to what you did on the record? And it's like, you know, when it gets to that, that part where, where in Still Rock and Roll to Me, when it goes from the shuffle into the straight fill, you know, people do that in the audience. If you don't do that, they just they go, oh. <laughs> I mean, that's, you don't have just one iconic fill. You've got, you know, dozens. You just you name a song. It's like, that song, it would, that song would be so much less with that. You're waiting, you're waiting for the fill. Here comes the fill. You're waiting right. for the intro of Allentown. You're waiting for, um, you know, the straight beat through um, Still Rock and Roll to Me, which was the number one song that like really, that, that's the one that, were, that was like smack in front of my face. You, there was a, what was a show, a Solid Gold. I think there was a TV show, yeah. Solid Gold. And it usually was filled with just pop bands. And then you guys were on there. I was like, wow. This song is really big <laughs> on prime time. Speaking of Alan White, I actually interviewed him a couple months ago and we were talking about that exact fill. Yeah. And uh, it, the interview didn't end up recording. Um, but I, you know, I got into his 80s oh. records and stuff. Yeah, it was a bummer. But um, he's a local guy. He actually just lives a few miles away. But um, yeah, we, we talked about that in um, his John Lennon days. Um, so I'm actually you know, well, really glad you brought that up in the book because uh, when I told him, when I told him, I think I mentioned it in the book when I told him uh, that I took that film, that that film from him, I stole it from him. He just put out his hand like this, like he wanted money, like I ordered royalties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I ran into him uh, two years ago at a bar near my house, and the World Series was on, and. I'm sitting at a booth by myself and the bar wasn't that packed. And then he comes over, this, this older guy comes over with a cane and he's like, excuse me, mate, I have some friends coming in. Do you mind moving over to the next booth or the next table? And usually I would be like, you know, like, what, what do you, you know, I was here first. And then I immediately knew who it was. I was like, yeah, no problem. No problem. Come on in. You know? And then he actually, to, he invited me to join his party and watch the world series, um, which was, which was cool. And then, I, I reminded him that he was a he was a judge at a guitar center drum off that I was in three uh, about five years earlier, and uh, he said, "Well, I bet I bet I gave you high grades." <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I don't know, maybe. I, yeah. I saw the other when you can, when you get these double bass drummers who who can play a clave with their left foot and thirty yeah. second triplets in the right, it's like and they're in they're in three piece suits, you know. It's like nah. Yeah, see, those are the guys <laughs> that are real drummers. Those are real drummers. Yeah. I'm not a real drummer. Uh, I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. they, they, they say we're lucky. <laughs> I yeah. don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, would you rather be, would you, would Willie, Willie Nelson's uh, quote is, I'd rather, be, I'd rather be lucky than talented, you know? <laughs> sure. I mean, no complaints with your career, man. It's like, phew. Well, it wasn't luck. I mean, uh, it was uh, playing with that guy, you know, with Billy. I, I, was for, I would say I was fortunate that I was able to play with a guy that had wrote in so many different styles mm -hmm. because it never got boring. Yeah. You know, I, I can't put two songs together back to back that sound the same. You know, like the Beatles, you can't do that. You can't put two songs back to back that sound the same. 
that have the same drum beat, that have the same, you know. I yeah, tried I mean, hard. I, I tried hard to make Rosalinda's eyes different than just the way you are. You know? I can generalize kind of like, oh, Glass House is your rock and roll record and Nylon Curtain is your Beatles record and Innocent right. Man is your retro Motown record. Kind of, but if you look, if you listen to Glass Houses, there's ballads all over the place. There's maracas, there's yeah. soft stuff, there's Farfisa thing, and Nylon Curtain, the same thing. You know, there's, there's a pop hit and with a weird Russian riff and then, uh, <laughs> you know, and then there's, you know, there's, there's a Spectre stuff. It's like, it, yeah. I can... It keeps you on your toes as a drummer, but that's cool because you're not back there going, the singer's going, uh, just play your normal thing, you know, that you do, you know, and right. we'll, just, we'll just clock in. You know. Right, like, uh, what's the name of the place with ACDC? Just play, just play that <laughs> beat. Just play that beat we've been playing for 40 years. Play the ACDC <laughs> beat and make sure you hit no cymbals after your right. drum fills. Phil so, Rudd, that's his name, Phil Rudd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Innocent Man, that, um, I mean, it comes across really well, it, it, your emote, even if, even if you're faking it or whatever you're doing, it's like that, it sounds like um, wall of sound. Um, and I think, was that the focus going in? Like, I want to do a Frankie Valley. Um, yeah. you know, that, that was it. Let's, let's do a theme oh, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, it was the tip of the hat to the, uh, those records that we grew up listening to. Gotcha. Those are the first records that we grew up, you know, yeah. the Drifters and, the, and all that kind of stuff. Four Seasons. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the bridge. So I actually probably practiced the bridge more than any other record. Um, and, you know, it starts off with a bang, the, you know, the, that quick tempo at 16th notes and, and things like that. And then a, a really underrated song, Code of Silence, the Cindy Lauper song, um, you know, you call it your backwards beat. But um, to me, it's, it's like vocal and drum. The, those two things just explode out of the speakers. Um, and I like your little, I don't know what you'd call it, but the right. that That's kind of thing to me is like, to me, I would say, do that Liberty DeVito thing. That, <laughs> that riff right there to me is the closest thing to like classifying just that pulse, that, that quick accent pulse. Yeah, that's the, the B section of the verse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the, this is the time, was, that was just, uh, you, you use, was that the first time you used Simmons on a record? The bridge. Um, the bridge. I think um, I might have used Simmons with Phil Ramon or with other artists, mm -hmm. you know. I think that's where I got shin splint from was on the bass drum of Simmons, you know, because it's a piece of hard plastic. Yeah. You know, it'll kill you. That kid, and, by the way, I think if it was that tour, the blue with the white rims, the white logs, oh, yeah. the blue yeah, yeah, and the yeah. Simmons, that was a pretty, <laughs> that was really was pretty. pretty. I like that. Yeah. That kid went to Russia. That was the, the Russian kid. Uh, yeah. It's, that, that drum kit is in a church on Long Island somewhere. Oh man, oh man! Did I don't you, keep my. Did you have any other samples in the Simmons, or was it just factory sounds that you're using? Yeah, just whatever we used on the record. You know, it wasn't a whole lot. You know, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I give my drums away after tours. You know, oh. who needs drums? You know, what am I gonna do? You know, guitar players can collect drums. Uh, can, can collect guitars because they can slip them under the bed. You know, <laughs> they fit. They, Drummers, you got to be in a warehouse if you're going to. I'm amazed. I see um, uh, uh, Todd Zuckerman all the time. You know, he's doing these lessons now online. Yeah. He's got like so many drums behind him. Uh, yeah. it's, it's like, what do you do? Just take them out of the box and set them up on, on a rack or something? You know, do you play all those drums? Well, the, from what I see on Instagram, dr drummers who are drummy, drummy, drummers like to take pictures of a lot of drums and stack them up and organize them and do it categorize them and color code them they do, and just line up all their pedals and that's what you do like if you're really into dolls you do that with dolls if you're into drums, yeah. you do the drums. i don't know records i like records <laughs> yeah. yeah you're a vinyl guy yeah yeah uh yeah i got i do have a couple of sets of drums i have the the last set that i played a thomas set with, with billy joel i have that set i have a 68 ludwig uh champagne sparkle nice Kit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, what else do I got? Uh, Mapex kit. 
and they, I do this uh, Liberty uh, drums now. Did you hear them? They're from, yeah, they're from uh, England. Oh, wow. They're a little boutique company out of England. Yeah, they sound great. Is there a website for that? Yeah, Liberty Drums. Liberty Drums. Com, I yeah. know. Yeah. Um, there's one note in the bridge, the Mulberry, the Mulberry Street song that wasn't in there, but there used to be a TV show called Moonlighting back in the yes. 80s. And uh, there was one really odd episode where they started off the whole episode with a musical piece. It had nothing to do with the show and they were dancing around and they used that song as the soundtrack and it took up, I don't know, but it took up the entire song for sure. Right. Uh, and uh, I'm sure it drove a, a, few, a few more uh, audience toward that record, but I, I just thought your feelings of like seeing that in a TV show in such an interesting way. Well, it's cool to see to hear your music on TV. That's a TV show, but the, like you said, the scene. Yeah, that's why it's not <laughs> mentioned in the book. It's like, yeah, it's well, really like I, that was pretty corny. I can't stand it when they put corny stuff behind your music. Yeah, you know, it, it's just weird. It's okay if they do stuff with, with, like in The Simpsons or something like that, or or even uh, 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 twi uh, Twins was it called uh, or uh, Brothers. Uh, when they had the band, at the end, they have a band playing. Uh, they're called the Uptown Girls or something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Step, uh, step Brothers. The Step Brothers. Uh, step, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. The Billy, the Billy Joel, uh, the 80s the cover band. band. Yeah. <laughs> Only Billy Joel's at the, at the 80s. <laughs> but, yeah, they're, they're always, like, uh, kind of making fun of Billy for some reason. You know? yeah. But um, uh, maybe because it's just popular, popularity or whatever. It is. I'm sure but, you got a you kick know. out of it. I do. I, but my biggest kick that I ever got was a Simpson episode where at the end, you know, when they play the credits and they, and they play the, the, uh, the Simpson theme song, whatever, they did it to the beat and groove of just the way you are. It was amazing to hear. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to research. I'm going to check that out. That sounds really cool. Um, I think I remember, I definitely saw it during the Stormfront tour, which I saw twice. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you did it in earlier tours, but you used to play the show. And then at the end of the show, you'd bring out a smaller kit towards the front of yeah. the stage and do make it a little more intimate. Um, uh, Only the Good Die Young and, and some other songs. Um, was right. that your idea? No, uh, that was the idea. Yeah, a lighting designer had a lot of ideas of mm. the, the, the show. But um, we've always considered ourselves a bar band, you mm. know, with Billy. And uh, so that, that, well, let us feature those couple of songs that were kind of like a bar band. Most bar bands do those songs, you know, like you may be yeah. right and, and that yeah. kind of stuff. So it, it, was, it was like, a, why don't you just come out front on a smaller kit and we can just rock the house, you know, like that instead of being up on the big kit, on the big riser. Yeah. You know, everybody gets tight in together like a bar it's band. A more like a, let's bring the arena into a campfire kind of vibe. Right, right, right. Um, da, 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 da. so, uh, you know, of course you don't have to go down any path you don't want to go down to, but I'm still a little, um, I'm a little gray on, so, so you, you had a period, uh, with, with a marriage and you were going through some things and you ended up in jail temporarily. And then, but you were also blindsided by not getting invited to Billy's wedding. And I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of years in there that I'm not connecting, yeah. but what do you, was it actually that incident that you think caused more separation between you and him? Or was it completely financial? No, the thing, uh, to be honest with you, the thing that uh, caused the separation. Now, Billy Joel is surrounded by a lot of people, mm -hmm. right? That, that do a lot of great work for him. I mean, you know, he's got, he's got a band, he's got a crew, he's got a, you know, truck drivers, he's got bus drivers, he's got agents, he's got lawyers, he's got, and he trusts everybody to be truthful with him, right? Yeah. So if somebody comes up to Billy and says, I heard that uh, Liberty said this, mm. this thing, and Billy doesn't come to me, he's going to believe what the guy says because he's trusting what the guy says, but he'll never know if it was true or not because he's not going to come to me. He's going to just go, oh, yeah? Well, that's it. I, I, the, the trust has been broken and I'm done. Hmm. So when I hear, I never find out 
what really happened or what was said, because nobody will tell me what was said, no matter who I ask, everybody's like, I don't know. I don't know what happened. Um, the mistake that I made was I should have went into Billy's driveway and stopped his car when he was coming out of his house <laughs> and said, what's going on here? And he would have told me what he heard. And I would have said, no, that didn't happen. It never happened. I didn't do that. You know, so it took 15, almost 16 years before we, we actually sat down and, and we found out what happened. And I told him, that, that's not right. No, yeah. that's not right. So he didn't, you know, was he the type not to, not to reach out like that and say, hey, what's actually going on here? He just, you'd rather. Yeah, hear yeah. He, he, he's kind of non, non confrontational, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, he won't run from a fight, but, but if he doesn't have to deal with it, he's got other people who deal with it. And I'm the same way. I mean, I'm, I'm more of the like, you know, and nah, I freak him. I don't care anymore. You know, that's crazy. Cause you, as you described, you, you guys are so close. It's yeah. Me, you know, that's why it was, it was kind of shocking that it actually happened because it was something that I thought would never happen because yeah. I know he loved, he loved to, he hates to rehearse, you know, mm, so I knew too. all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and, and somebody said to me, he goes, how could he get rid of you? You know, where the bodies are buried. <laughs> you know? Right. So, Right. So, uh, yeah. Would he, would he sometimes just want to show up at the show and not rehearse at all? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Let's do this tonight. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, we did it. We did, a, the last second. we did a live thing from VH1 and half the songs we did, we'd never played before. Yeah. <laughs> he would always pull out a Beatles song or something like that. You know? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry about that. That's crazy. Um, that, yeah, I mean, but it was cool though. Party life. It, it's cool now though because it, we're we're in a both in better places. Yeah, you, you know, I mean, we both got remarried again. We both have young children again. Uh, you know, he's doing his thing. He wants to wind down. I went when I met with him. It was great meeting with him because he wants to wind down, kind of start to retire, and I didn't want the gig back. I just wanted my friend back. You know. Yeah. So it was great just to meet with him. Yeah. You know? um, so th this channel has to do with um, coming, recovering in general, whether it be, um, you know, uh, injuries or substance and, and trying to get back to it for, for musicians in general, mainly drummers, drum recovery network. And so um, I, I, you do detail um, some of the illnesses and injuries you had in the book. Right. What was the longest, um, maybe more, most frustrating um injury or illness you've had getting back to the drum kit? Oh, I'd say, um, well, the, the car accident was, was bad, yeah. but I had decided that because I was on the road traveling and trying to make it big, that I wasn't going to do that. I, this is ridiculous. I'm not doing it. I just hurt myself doing it. I'm going to try to take another path. You know, luckily, I had to put the radio on when I went to my daytime job and the music called me back, you know, yeah. uh, but the leg, I thought my career is over mm. because I, you know, I, I playing with my band, the Lords and, and the other band, the, the Slim Kings, I, we were on fire. I mean, we're playing all the time. We're playing hard, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, what did I just do? And I did it to myself because I knew I couldn't walk on this leg anymore. I had to mm. do something. And I was promised this miraculous uh, recovery, which wasn't happening at the time, yeah. you know? And I thought, it's over, it's done. What am I gonna do now, you know? Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, friends were like, it'll be fine, you'll be fine, it'll be yeah. fine. It's gonna take time, but you'll be fine. Whatever it takes to do. And the first couple of shows I did with the Lords, I brought another guy with me, another drummer. Mm. And he played half the show. Oh, okay. And I went up to the front of the crowd and I said, hey, look, I just have my knee done. I can't play the whole show. Uh, this friend of mine is going to play half of the show. And they were fine with it. As long as I stood up in front and they could see me there. Yeah. <laughs> it's really weird. Were you know you when they say you could, you know when they say you could fart on stage and people will love it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was it. It's, yeah. <laughs> that, that's when you know you've made it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm probably there now. Uh, yeah, I was I was yeah. promised I was promised ninety percent you know recovery and and it's slow. Oh, um, so slow. Yeah, 
very impatient. And then you're afraid to do anything, yeah. right? You're afraid to like, oh, I might hurt myself, you know? Well, no, I, I probably fall twice a week just walking the dogs because oh. my, brain, my brain is ahead of my legs. And so I'm still a fall risk, but I can sit at the kit and play. Walking is a different story. <laughs> I used to yeah. run about 10 miles a day. So I really miss that, you know, the endorphins. <clears throat> yeah. But, you know, um, and then uh, along with, um, it's, it sounds like you're, um, you're in a good spot now. Have you changed anything with, with diet or fitness uh, as you're going oh, yeah. older and keeping playing drums? Yeah, I was getting um, uh, arthritis, um, bursitis, whatever, in my arms and stuff. And um, I had stopped eating meat, yeah. that was, you know, just because that was, was making me sluggish and, and whatever. Yeah. But uh, my uh, daughter said, my daughter, she's a TV star and she has all these diets and stuff like that, you yeah. know? So she told me, she goes, stop eating dairy, dad, just stop. So I stopped. And, and within a few, not even weeks, it went away. It, was, it, was, it just went away. It was like a miracle. So hmm. now I, I don't eat meat and I don't, eat, don't do any dairy. You know, I, I'm kind of a vegan, yeah. but, uh, but I'll order, order the pasta from my local uh, uh, Italian restaurant with the meatball sauce on it. You know, I sure, won't eat sure. the meatball, but I'll put the meatball sauce on cheat, it. You know? Cheat day. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd be into, uh, my wife's such a meat eater because she, she trains in jiu-jitsu and she just comes back like, give me steak. But uh, I, I can, I've heard the benefits from many musicians that I've interviewed about going to vegetarian at least, not necessarily vegan, but the dairy, I definitely have found a difference. I don't really do the dairy anymore and it really does affect me, you know, the nasal, the nasal passages and breathing and my right. skin and all that stuff. I used, to, um, I used to wake up and, and, and eat a big thing of yogurt and I'd hit it all day. If I got hungry, I'd be eating yogurt, you know, regular yogurt. Yeah. And at night, I'd have ice cream, you know, just regular <laughs> ice cream, a pint of ice cream in front of the TV set. And mm -hmm. It's like, oh my God, you know, no, no more. And you still say, you still say, stayed slender through all that. It's just in your DNA. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was lucky enough, uh, you know. I mean, it was a time when I, I gained a few pounds when I first, I moved to Florida in 94, I think mm -hmm. it was. I was down there for nine years. And um, I, I would be eating breakfast when my friend would call me and go, come on down to the hotel, you own the hotel. Come on down to the hotel for lunch. I'd be like, okay, okay, I'm right there. Because <laughs> I, I was bummed that I was in Florida. I didn't like it, you know. Yeah, not a Florida fan? No, uh, for a vacation? Yeah. Yes, but to live there, no. Yeah, I got you. No. Um, so uh, from that, from the sessions with Don and and Paul and Steve Lukather, you were mentioning that your band, the Slim Kings, were, you were doing. Um, you were were you playing out or were you doing virtual shows? Oh, virtual shows. Mm -hmm. We uh, the the Lords of Fifty Second Street have played a, a couple of shows out. We did the parking lot shows. You know, okay. the cars beep instead of people <laughs> applauding. It's really strange. Wow. But, you know, you, you sell out the, the, this whole big parking lot, you know? Yeah. Um, but the Slim Kings, uh, like we're going to do a, a virtual from Daryl's house, you know, live at Daryl's house oh, on wow. the 8th of November. So Sunday. Oh, cool. I'm going to tune into that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, stuff. I just did one with Billy J. Kramer. Uh, you know, he, he was managed by Brian Epstein when the Beatles were managed by him and the Beatles wrote his first four hit records. I just did one from Daryl's house with him. Which was, it's really cool. It's strange not having an audience, but mm -hmm. I find that um, in the beginning when you start your band and you start to play, people don't wanna have anything to do with you, right? So instead of getting off on the crowd, you have to get off on something. You get off on the other players. You start mm -hmm. to play to each other, or look at me, I'm great. Look at you, you're great, you know. It went back to that again. It's like, aren't we great? Because nobody else is out there. <laughs> Just tell us we're great. Yeah. So we're going to have to do something to really inspire us to do, you know, to do this. You know, there's, you can't do what Billy used to do uh, at the shows when put girls in the first two rows, you know, it's to, to right. lift your, uh, you know, performance. <laughs> that old trick. Yeah. Oh, that old trick. That's the second time I fell for that one. <laughs> do, you, do you have another one lined up? Another virtual show coming up? Just the, the Daryl's. Uh, oh, just the Daryl's one? Cool. Yeah, November 8th, yeah. That should be cool. 
Well, I won't keep you forever. Um, I do want to remind people to buy this. Go to Hudson Music. Um, yeah. It's really, it really is a different um, kind of music book. Um, especially, I really love. See, a, lot, a few of the you know musician Hall of Famers that I've interviewed, they don't have the the memory detail that you have, and it, they can't remember. Some of them can't remember complete decades, or maybe they'd rather not remember. Yeah but i love you're you're very detailed in in um your memories throughout this from from album to album through your whole career it's kind of the way i work too i, I have that kind of memory where i'm an emotional guy and i connect yeah. to, like unfortunately i connect way too much to my past and, and um um so i definitely connected to the way this book was written so i appreciate um that style um how it came off and i, I encourage everyone to go out and get the book and support well, um yeah, go for it. Well, like you know, uh, um, th th this book is, is, is the roads that I took to eventually play with the, the biggest single artist you know, in the States, one of the biggest single artists in the States. And some of those roads uh, w were very dark, you oh, know? Yeah. But it, the, people think the world of music is like uh, American Idol. Mm -hmm. uh, no, so it's not down. like that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Long and winding road and you've got to, you got to love music. I mean, you got to love playing your instrument like you do. Right. Um, that, that, that the drum is what stuck by you the whole time. You yes, kept mentioning it, yes, that my was. drum, my yep. drum, my drum through all the dark yep. times. Yeah. And you got to have that because I did teach uh, at a, the biggest corporate music school in the world for about three years. I was a music director and oh. 80% of the kids that came to the door didn't even like music. They got a guitar for Christmas or, or their parents forced them to go there. There, And it's like, you can tell the ones who are like, you can tell the ones who are connected to it, they want to do something with it. And the ones who are just like, it's a, it's a toy or whatever. Um, right. And, uh, and the, in the time you spend by yourself, because you love Ringo so much or the pretender so much or whatever it is, the time you spend by yourself for hour and hours and hours after school, those are the real times you get better, especially yeah. as a self-taught musician, because it connects with you emotionally so much and you're not on a practice pad getting, you know, perfect spacing right. with the wrist and stuff. And that, that does tend to burn you out unless you want to be in an orchestra or a marching band, I guess. Right. You got to you always ask the question of like, when you're listening to music, why does this feel so good to me? Mm -hmm. Why does it feel so good to me? Why did the drummer play that? What he played, even if it's as simple as it is, why did he play that? You know, and when you try to figure that out and you find out why he did that, it's like, oh, I see. It was because the bass player or the guitar player or the immersion of the song. Then you're learning music. You're not just playing drums anymore. Now you're playing music. You know. Yeah. Was there um, was there much influence? Some, some singers, you know um have, have visions and in and they can hear certain rhythms in their head did you did you ever collaborate with billy where he would he was like can you do a feel like good and he would like sing it out and you would try to mimic that yeah he he did that a couple of times or sometimes he would call me up and say i got a song can you do the beat too like i'll oh, just name a song tomorrow I never knows by the beatles yeah and i would say yeah i can play that beat but I'll do something, I'll add something a little different so nobody really knows that it's tomorrow never knows that we're playing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah, I like I like those kind of um I've been in a couple bands where the leaders they don't know how to do it on the kit, but they'll sing it to you. Right. And um you it's up to you to translate it properly. I love that. Right, right. My favorite <laughs> story of that, my favorite story of that is is little Richard explaining mm. to uh the drummer. I want you to play this in the beginning of the song. Bop, 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 bop. <laughs> I want you to play that in the beginning of the song. Look at it. Uh, why don't you do that? <laughs> you know? Oh, right. <laughs> That's know? great. I love that. Yeah. I just saw that uh, Jerry Lee Lewis is going to be performing. I guess he's still alive. He's going to have a yeah, birthday show here in a couple days. With a bunch of all-star guests. Wow. I'm surprised. I'm surprised you're not at that show. Oh, Kenny Aronoff is uh, doing that. Oh. Yeah. Of course he is. Of course, he does everything. <laughs> also, everyone, so I got a flyer here. Slim King's flyer. Oh, yeah, that can't wait to book, right? Yeah. You can find him on Facebook and Instagram, slimkings.com. Join the Slim Kingdom. Celebrity DeVito yes. and the Slim Kings. You can find him on Spotify, yes. Apple Music, all that. 
this looks like it was shot at um, a lounge in Portland, but I'm sure it was out by you. No, it was a, a place called uh, <laughs> Junior's in New York, in Brooklyn. Okay. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you taking the time um, and uh, putting up with my uh, um, bugging you all the time. It finally well, worked out, and I really appreciate it. You got a bug. A lot of guys are like, you know, they ask you once, and because you're doing so many other things, it's like, oh, yeah. I got to check my calendar, and then you forget, and then you, you know. Yeah. But if they bug, then you go, oh, shit, this guy's bugging me, and I got to figure this out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it works. Yeah. It worked. Like yeah. I said, Martin Chambers, Liberty DeVito, Neil Peart, Terry Bazio, like Michael DeRozier, that, that was it for me. That's, that's, that's what wanted, that's what made me fall in love with the drums. And I'm so glad to connect with you and be able to share that with you. This meant a lot to me. Well, thanks for uh, being persistent. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, good luck to you. And, and I'm glad you're in a better place now. I appreciate it. And I'll send you a link when this is all edited up. Do it, do it, do it. And good luck to you too. All right. Talk Stay to you. well. Stay well. Bye.